Okay. Welcome to Trinity Presbyterian Church. My name is Justin, and I am glad to be your pastor and church planter. This morning, we're going to be looking at the theme of contentment, uh, Christian contentment and satisfaction in life. It is my desire that you walk away with much more satisfaction than you entered with. This is my, my great prayer and hope for us, and, and that is not something I can produce in any of us or in myself, but this is a great work of the Holy Spirit. And I want to take a moment right now to just pray and ask God to, to, uh, to send His Spirit this morning in a special way. Let's pray. Our Father in Heaven, we ask that Your Son uh, would bless us today, that we would be blessed as we look to Christ, as we look to His Word, as we prepare our hearts. We ask this morning that You would... Uh, send your spirit, that, your, that you would give us the, the, the understanding and the heart of Christ this morning. We ask that we would have uh, a full dose of your spiritual medicine this morning for our sick souls. We are sinners in need of your grace, and we ask that your spirit would direct us this morning in worship. We ask that you would bring us into... Uh, communion with you, and that you'd empower us, we pray, uh, to be content, to be content in Christ. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Okay, our, our, our text today is going to be Ecclesiastes 6, Ecclesiastes 6, and on the theme of contentment, let's look to our second page of our bulletin, and it's going to be, I'm going to read this morning, I'm going to read Richard Pratt, actually. Let's read Richard Pratt. And it says, to grasp the meaning of the scriptures for our times, we must first understand its original meaning, the meaning intended for its first readers. Legitimate Christian applications must accord with the purposes for which the Holy Spirit first inspired the book. And it's a key theme for our church. We are a biblical church. We're not just using the Bible to further our, our agenda, but we're using the Bible as it's intended by the Spirit. That's our hope. And, and, to, and to grow in our understanding of the, of the scripture and how to use it. Uh, for God's glory. So that's a Richard Pratt quote. I've actually had this on the bulletin the last four weeks. I wanted to highlight that today. But let's get to the second quote, which is Christian contentment based on Philippians 4, 11 sermon series by Jeremiah Burroughs, who was a, who was a member of the Westminster Assembly who wrote our confession. Very interesting character. Uh, died before it was finished on a, a tragic fall in a horse riding accident on the way home. But listen to this. The Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, grace-filled condition of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly management in every condition. Let me read that again. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, grace-filled condition of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly management in every condition. I love that uh, definition because I feel like it encapsulates the, the chief end of man, which is to glorify God, submitting to, and then delighting in, enjoying in God's wise and fatherly management in every condition. So it's, great, it's a great definition of contentment from Jeremiah Burroughs. With that said, let's prepare hearts for worship. And as we do so, let's now stand if able, and we will call, we have the call to worship from Psalm 100 today. That will be on page three of your order of worship. And should be on the PowerPoint as well. I'll read the minister part and we'll all read the people part together. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, you are in the, in the heavens above, and we are on earth, as Ecclesiastes teaches, but we know that you are not transcendent only, but you are eminent, and you dwell in the hearts of your people. So we ask, Lord, that you would teach us your word this, this morning, that you would uh, instruct us in godliness and in contentment. Godly contentment, that is. Let us dwell 
in your presence, asking for your help, and you richly giving it because you love to delight and, and bring joy to your children. You are the Heavenly Father and we are yours. You have adopted us, claimed us to be your own, rescued us out of death and sin, and brought us into your kingdom and to sit at your table and the banquet and feast forevermore. Now we are sojourners, we are pilgrims, our home is not here, but our home is to come and we, when we will dwell and see you face to face, Lord Jesus. So we ask that you prepare us in the meantime to be content to be powerful witnesses of you, of you, workers for your glory and, and worshipers for your sake. We ask for these things to be done in and through us as your church. Lord, we ask that we would embody the fullness of the mystery of godliness, that we would embody the attributes of patience and of faithfulness and endurance in the midst of suffering, in the midst of plenty, in the midst of want, in all of life's Um, uh, gifts that you give us as as we experience them from your hand would you give us the joy of knowing where from whence they come from whom they come we ask lord that you give us these things for your glory and your sake and you build us up this morning we pray now also according to the example you gave your disciples saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first hymn this morning, as we have prayed to our Lord, is to praise Him, which is number 53, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Would you say that we are a 
Christian nation. Uh, I would I would dispute that. Uh, how can a nation be Christian? I would say uh, we uh, when we do not actually follow and worship the Lord uh, holy uh, and. And one way of following the Lord is that in our freedom, uh, which we have obtained through the grace of our Lord Jesus, is we freely, willingly, and thankfully submit to his will. And we find his will to be a delight. His law is good. As we see what his will is for our lives, we, our hearts grow in joy. And we want to please him because we're united to Christ. As you look now in your hymnal, if you go back to the back of the hymnal, you'll find a tool that is useful for examining the law of God. And and in the law of God, we're talking about the summary in the Ten Commandments. We've been going through the Ten Commandments the last few weeks, and now we're on commandment number six. And so what the Westminster Shorter Catechism does in the back of our hymnal on page 874 is it lists through all the Ten Commandments, quotes them from Exodus in question 67 in this particular instance, and then it'll have two following questions uh, as, the, as the authors of this catechism have collated uh, an answer to the question of what is required and what is forbidden. And if we had the footnotes here, we'd see that all the lines are justified with scripture references. But as you think about the commandment of murder, it's interesting that Jesus uses this commandment as the first example of what it is to keep the law in the Sermon on the Mount. And I would feel like it's, if, he, if he's going to call out self-righteous uh, Pharisees on, on their lack of law-keeping, you'd think that he would start somewhere else because we always think, well, Murder is such an easy one to do. I mean, not many of us are murderers, like literal murderers who have killed someone. But he goes on to say that it is, in the, in the, the spirit of the law is much more than refraining from stabbing someone uh, and taking their life in that way. Uh, there's much more involved in valuing life as God does and imaging him. So that's, that's, the, that's the answer to, to what we're doing here. We're looking at the law. We're going to examine how do we value life when we look at the sixth commandment. Okay, let's start. Let's start now. We're going to go to 67. Question 67, what is the Sixth Commandment? The Sixth Commandment is, thou shalt not kill. 68, what is required in the Sixth Commandment? The Sixth Commandment requireth all lawful endeavors to preserve our own life and the life of others. 69, what is forbidden in the Sixth Commandment? The Sixth Commandment forbiddeth the taking away of our own life or the life of our neighbor unjustly, or whatsoever tendeth thereunto. Right now, we're going to confess our sin. We're going to use a a prayer based on the prayers prayed by David in Psalm 51, who was guilty of murder uh, and and, and, and broke this command. And then we'll look at uh, praying privately as we pray silently, and then we'll hear the gospel together. Let's, uh, let's, let's pray together corporately. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Amen. Amen. Look up and hear these words. Now, it's very interesting that the commandment of taking the life, taking away life, killing our sin and our guilt, and its power is overcome through the taking of the life of the Son, through the blood of Jesus. The redemption is through the blood of Jesus, meaning he was a victim of this sin. Uh, Thou shalt not kill all of our sin 
was why he went to the cross, not for his own, but for ours, and took the judgment. Here it says here, Ephesians 1, 7, In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of God's grace. Amen. Let's stand and sing, not only that Jesus was killed, but that he is risen. Number 277, Christ the Lord is risen today. seated so we consider the time in our service where we give offerings we must remember that everything we have been gifted given is a gift from God himself and we are responsible for stewarding it as you consider all that you have consider the investments you make and we make as a church we're to steward our, our resources well because they are God's let's pray and ask him to bless this offering Our God in heaven, you've given us the grace to have resources to give. We ask that you would open our hands and open our hearts to give freely when we see need, to give freely when we see uh, uh, an opportunity to serve. And we, we we ask that you would create in us appreciation of your mercies, that we might become merciful and embody your attribute of mercy as we give. Lord, we ask that you would uh, build up your church through uh, the resources that we have and expand our ministry to include uh, many, many, many saints whom you will call. But we know that your number of elect is fixed. We ask that Trinity Presbyterian Church and its giving would be useful for the drawing in of many, that you would bring many, many people, including us in this very room, into the presence of your Spirit and change us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're not going to pass the plate today. The plates are in the back of the room. And you may give online by going to our app. It's called Church for Norman, a Church for Norman, Trinity Presbyterian Church app. And that can be found on your app store or online at our website, trinitynorman.com. Those are the ways to offer tithes and offerings today. With that said, if you are able, please stand with us and we'll sing the doxology together. Praise the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 
Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, our lovely heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Our friends, we actually confess our faith together each and every week, and we've been using the Apostles' Creed this year. The Apostles' Creed is noteworthy because it's not just a list of facts, but it is a history of God's work for our salvation in history. And it concludes with several blessings that the Holy Spirit uh, is responsible primarily for, which is uh, our communion with God and, and in and the working in us and, and regenerating us uh, bringing us into the forgiveness of sins and, and ultimately the resurrection of our bodies and life everlasting. And to know this, friends, is great rest. This is great contentment. This is, this is joy. And this is satisfaction. To know that you have communion with the, with the Lord, of our Maker, and all of His people forevermore. And the peace and rest of having our sins forgiven and the hope of eternity with Him. This is good news. So let's confess. I'll ask you, what do you believe and in whom you trust? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's go to pray. Our God in heaven, you've given us uh, many, many blessings. We thank you for each and every one. Uh, we wish that we could number them all. Uh, we ask that we could number them all, but we Thank you primarily for this body of believers. What a blessing each and every soul here is. Each and every gift that you've given has blessed us. And we thank you for the way you've been building us together. We ask that you continue to grow us into maturity. Work in us in a particular way today where we would walk away with much more satisfaction, much more joy and contentment and rest than when we began this hour of worship. We ask, Lord, that you would work in our community through us, our, that our church would be full of the gospel, full of your spirit, and full of, of joy, that everyone would see your attributes embodied as we suffer, as we, as we thrive in all things. We know satisfaction in these gifts from you. Lord, we ask that you would grow us up into uh, men and women who fear you, who love you, who are wise. We ask for our children to be full of your spirit, to be brought up in, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We ask that you use our church to do that. We ask that you would bring each of us as we move along from the first quarter of life to the last. We ask that you would cause us to be faithful. We do not take for granted that we know the truth of the perseverance that occurs through union with Christ, that you uphold us each and every day by your mighty hand, you protect us. We ask, Lord, that you would again protect us from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation. Protect us. Protect us from deception. Many people are looking for our, for, for our uh, attention and, and, to, and to just draw us away from Christ. And we ask that none of these schemes would prosper. But you would guard us. Protect us, shepherd, we ask. Lord, we ask this morning as we uh, are tasked with praying for men and women in all positions of leadership. Uh, it's an awkward position. We, we have a, a, in our nation a, an executive officer, president-elect. Uh, it's in dispute right now, so we ask that you would guide all those who are in, in, in uh, power to, uh, to affect that, to weigh in on this and to judge these matters. Give them wisdom and, and, a, and a right path ahead. Uh, we ask that you would bring about justice in these matters. We ask that you bring about righteousness. We ask that you would bring about repentance in all. As, as, uh, as each of the candidates in every single election in our country 
has been uh, drawn into murderous plots against the uh, other, other character, maybe even to assassinate characters. We ask that you bring about repentance and new faith. We ask that the gospel be preached to each and every candidate. We ask that every, all these uh, leaders that we now, now have through this election uh, would be uh, strengthened and empowered by you to succeed in their callings and to function for our good, for the ordering of your world, for righteousness to go forward, for wickedness to be punished. We ask that each and every one would, would play its role as our daily bread, as, as, as the things that we need in order to live in a sinful world. Uh, and we ask that uh, when, when we do uh, experience uh, heartaches and hard things and sicknesses, that we turn to you. We thank you that we're relatively healthy. We ask that you provide us uh, a quick recovery from the COVID-19 uh, uh, scare. Uh, and, and that real people are, are out there getting sick. We ask that you pr- uh, pr- protect us from that and, and, and bring about healing bring about uh, elimination of this with a vaccine. Pray for those who are caring for those who are in sick right now. We ask for your help and, and protection upon them. We ask for you to protect us, give us these things. We ask even, Lord, that you provide in a specific way for our church. We ask for uh, uh, the, the raising up of elders and deacons. And we ask for uh, ministry leaders in, in all areas, in our financial team, a new treasurer, a new a new worship leader, uh, a new, uh, in many ways, uh, just a social media uh, servant, uh, someone who could serve in those uh, very practical ways. Uh, if there's uh, any gifts that we have, Lord, would you call us to, to deploy them for your sake and for your kingdom, for Jesus, we pray. And we ask for all these things in the name of Christ. We pray now for the teaching of your word that would go forward and, and accomplish its purposes in Christ's name. Amen. Now we're going to move into the children's uh, message today, the Ch- Trinity Kids message. So as we think about that, I ask you every week, would you please flex your muscles with me here? You know, this is it. You know, bring your muscles up, flex them. When you flex this muscle, when you're using your muscles, you are what? You're training them. They're getting, they're getting stronger because they're, they're, use, they're in use. And when they recover, when they rest, then they get to grow bigger and stronger and more powerful. What's well, a very sad and, and tragic reality that we don't use our spiritual muscles that much. We, we, we let them atrophy when we don't consider God's uh, world and his truth. And so we, want to, we asked the question last week, kids, of where do we get our information? And we said things like, oh, well, we ask our parents, we Google things, we look on YouTube. There's a lot of ways we get information, but how do we know about how to know God and glorify him? What's the answer? The in the... Bible, yeah, okay, yeah, in the Bible, right, so that's the answer to the question, oh, you guys are sleepy today, so who, I'm going to ask you guys, do you know who wrote the Bible? Okay, Lily. There was a man who inspired by the Holy Spirit. Did y'all hear that? Chosen men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. How'd you know that? Because we sing it. Yeah, we sing it. Okay, so check it out. We sing it, but it's not just a song we made up. We get this, this truth from a verse. And I want to read this. I want you to read this verse with me. Let's go to the next slide here. Oh, holy scripture. Let's look at that. Scripture. What is scripture? It's writings. It was the scrolls and the, and the codexes eventually. Uh, to, uh, that where the, where the, the writing from God, as men carry on the Holy Spirit, wrote these things down and it is holy I mean, we need to set apart or sacred so we call it holy scripture right so can you all say that with me holy, holy scripture. scripture it's different it's not like other books it's not like a, a Harry Potter book or Abraham Lincoln book it's a holy writing from God as men were carrying all the Holy Spirit so that's different than all men so your Bibles that you have are different they're holy Sacred. Is that a, can y'all say holy again? Holy. holy. Okay, different. Okay, let's get that in our heads. Next one. Where do you learn how to love? We already said that. Where do you learn how to uh, love and obey God in the Bible alone? All right, so let's go to the next one. Who wrote the Bible? Chosen men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Grace, can you read that verse up there? Real loud. Okay. 2 Peter 2 21. Real loud. Spirit. 
Okay, excellent. That's where we get that. That's exactly what the song says. All right, so I'm going to sing it, and y'all sing it with me. We're going to sing this one. So it goes, Who wrote the Bible? Chosen men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. All right, let's do it again. Who wrote the Bible? Chosen men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Okay. I feel like I was carrying that one. Uh, you guys got to help me out here. So um, next week, we'll have some, uh, some, some treats if you, if you participate in the children's lesson. Don't want to spoil you guys, but treats next week. So be, be aware of that. That's coming up. As we conclude our time today in the children's lesson, let's now sing the glory of Pacha together. Everybody, if you'll stand with me, if you're able, please. Glory we be to the Father. And to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Remain standing, if you will, please. And let's read the Word of God together. We're going to read today Ecclesiastes chapter 6. It will be in your Bibles, of course, which I highly recommend you bring a Bible. Uh, and then if you don't have your Bible today, we have them on the, the verses in the bulletin and also on the PowerPoint. Let's read together Ecclesiastes 6. It says, There is an evil that I have seen under the sun. And it lies heavy on mankind, a man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the same or the one place. All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes uh, than the wondering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good to man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Am I still coming through loud and clear to you guys? It's coming down. It's not, it's not on. It's not on. Okay. Let me just give you this uh, back, and you can, you can work on it. And if you get it going, let's do it. I have this one available if it works also. Now, multiple opportunities here. This, chapter 6 of Ecclesiastes, follows, of course, chapter 5. And we were two weeks ago in the, uh, chapter 5 where the coalette, the preacher, Solomon, is meditating upon wealth. And, and as it regards, uh, really, the theme of the book, which is one, chapter 1-3, uh, which says... Is there gain to be had in 
toil under the sun. Are all of our days of life vanity or meaningless, or is there meaning? And he's explored various ways of finding meaning and concluded that a life lived under the sun with no regard to God is vanity, fleeting, meaningless. But a life lived under the sun with an above the sun perspective that God is the giver of all things and is, and is creating all things and is working in these things, well, then there is true meaning. There is joy. And he concluded in a good place last time with verse 19. It said, Everyone also to whom God's given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God, for he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. So even the hard things, joy in his heart. He's got joy in his heart because God's given him this thing and the ability to experience these as gifts and enjoy them rather than just accumulating and never having joy in these things that he's after. Uh, well, God keeps us occupied with joy in the heart. And that's a very profound point, is it not? Last time we saw this picture that was painted in the 1500s of a moneylender and his wife. And the moneylender is looking at his coins and just awing over the coins. And then the, the wife is sitting there on the side you know, trying to study her scriptures and she's distracted by the coins. And how we can get, you know, we can get into the love of money and it can distract us from true meaning and joy in Christ. That was the theme last week. Now we've got a, a, just a little tweak on that theme. In 6, you know, we, we, we talked about pleasures aren't evil and money's not evil. It's part of God's world, of course. The love of money is another God. Well, God has given us the opportunity as men and women to acquire many things. But the one thing you and I are incapable of acquiring is joy in the things. Deep and fulfilling enjoyment of life. C.H. Spurgeon once said, If you have rightly believed in Jesus Christ, you will become, from that time forward, a different man than the one you were before. Now, wherever there is faith in Jesus Christ, a miracle of purification has been wrought in the heart. A miracle of purification has been worked in the heart wherever there is faith in Jesus. That's what Charles Spurgeon said. Where is he getting that from? 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says that whoever is in Christ is a new creature. The old has gone, the new has come. So you who are in Christ, who have faith in Him, you are fundamentally different. You, among all the creatures of the world, all the peoples of the world, have the capacity to have satisfaction in life. Satisfaction is the elusive thing we're looking for. Satisfaction, we're really good at life and liberty, but the pursuit of happiness or satisfaction is where we struggle. We're on to the next one. We're, we're thinking, oh, this thing's going to do it. This thing's going to do it. We're on to the next one. We don't know where, how to find satisfaction in our current world apart from God and His revealing that to us and gifting us with that. As the Rolling Stones, who were not American, but they were British, you know, used to sing, I can't get no satisfaction. And that's biblical. You know, I can't do it. God can give it. Okay, now, all right, so let's get to it. The slide on the screen here is a cover of a book called Epic. Epic is a book written by Tim Challies, who is a blogger, and, and he had the opportunity to travel around the world, and he wrote a book about it and produced videos about it, where he took 30, 33 objects, and he writes about them in order to tell the story of the church from day one to current day, exploring the earth. And there's... 10 videos on this, but the book takes you through all the objects and the stories behind them and the people behind them. One of the chapters in the book, let's see, what's the next thing here? Go to the next one. Aha! This is Me Malar. Me Malar. This is a 72-year-old woman who has lived her entire life in India. Now, isn't that interesting? You know, the Christian church didn't start in India. Uh, Me Malar lived her whole life there, is currently living, and has met Tim Challies, and is in the book, of course, that's where I got the picture. 
But her story really began many years before her birth, where another woman was born, and her name was Amy, Amy Carmichael. She was born in a small seaside village in Northern Ireland. And just a point of clarification, we just had a woman elected to the second highest office in the country, which is really, really noteworthy. People are making a big deal about this. Now, I would argue that Amy Carmichael is much more inspiring, if you know her story, than any woman who has ever taken a political office or been elected to something. Listen to what she did. Let me tell you this. She was born in a Christian home. She, gro- she grows up in a Christian home. She is sent to boarding school where she encounters Jesus. She believes in Jesus. Then, in, she's born in, just to give you context, born in 1867. In 1889, she travels to India, Dunavir, India. But before that, as, a 20, as she's a 22-year-old at that time, she's already planted a church, or started a church in Ireland called the Welcome Church. She left boarding school and immediately started working with the poor people in her community and they call this Welcome Church. There's a, there's a little pamphlet that, that uh, Tim Challies has, and it says, Come one, come all to the Welcome Hall. Come in your working clothes. This is, this is her desire is to in, introduce people to Christ. Now, she goes to India. She's, she's recruited in the missions board there, so she gets there, and a, a ministry has already begun. She finds that in this remote place, it's in the southern part of, southernmost part of India. So she goes to the northern part of Ireland, the southernmost part of India. In this place, she finds out that young girls are being forced into ritual prostitution in Hindu temples and is, of course, outraged. Amy wanted to rescue each and every one of these women and to raise them in a safe environment as her adopted children. And that is her story. In 1927... She founded an orphanage for young girls that is still there, and that has developed into a church and a hospital as well. Now, Tim Challies, who has traveled to India, meets this woman and hears her story. Now, you won't believe this. In 1948, she met Amy Carmichael. She was three years old. And then she and then three years old later, or three years later, she or Amy dies. This lady has lived 72 years there, 69 years of her life, on site there where Amy started this ministry to orphans. And now that's what she does. Now, what's fascinating is that she, as she tells the story, the first day she met Amy, Amy took her into her arms, prayed for her, and gave her that name, Mimalar, which, is, uh, which means in the, in the language there, beautiful flower. So she takes this cast-off girl, this orphan, who's probably got a life of forced prostitution in, in her future, and takes her, embraces her, prays for her, calls her beautiful flower. That is beautiful. And Mia, Mia Millar has now devoted her entire life to ministry and serves there now. One of her duties is to play the church bell. So she takes Tim Challies up to the top of the steeple and then rings the church bell. She's like, hey, what do you want to hear? Amazing grace. And then bang, amazing grace, amazing grace, amazing grace. To the hills, the next thing you see on the camera is the mountains of India are hearing the amazing grace chimes as the beautiful flower flower plays the most beautiful and amazing message in the world. Now, the world is full of grievous evil, as the preacher says in Ecclesiastes 6.2, and what is this grievous evil, this thing that makes him sick? It's that there surely aren't more Amy Carmichaels and me Millars out there. There's a lot of people who don't know uh, satisfaction. And they, they may have a lot and they may have little. Amy and me Millar had very little in the eyes of the world. But if you're in Christ, you and I know what Amy Carmichael and me and Millar knew And that's we have a gift that we never had the power to acquire and that we receive merely by grace, which is faith in Christ. This is the gift of God. We're new creatures. God's sovereign grace did that. He gifted those women and he gifts each of these men and women 
that gift. And that's what makes the preacher sick as he looks and sees a world where this is not true. It's a grievous evil. It's an evil on mankind. And you know what? He's become that man. The vanity man. The meaningless man. This is Solomon, we believe, who had so much. He had so much. He lacked nothing, as it says in there. Nothing of his desires. He's really preaching to himself. He's been this same guy. The verse says, but he doesn't enjoy what he has. Someone else will one day enjoy his things. And Solomon had lived that. He'd had everything, but evidently forgot that God gave him the wealth, the possessions, the honor that he had, right? Because what does 1 Kings 11, 1 through 8 tell us? He left the Lord behind. He, he, he totally ran past his commandments and, and d- abused God's law, turning his heart from God. So Solomon turned from the Lord, forgetting that God gives all things, which is the principle number one today. God gives all things, even the ability to enjoy life. Now, principle two is that not all people, of course, receive the ability to enjoy life and to be satisfied. That's evident from the text that we've read and from examples that Amy Carmichael and Mee Millar are not standard. These are extraordinary examples. And you are extraordinary. You are not the majority. You are the minority in this world. If you find satisfaction, you are not normal. You are super normal. You're supernatural. You're a gift. God's given you these things. And this is why someone who knew better and had repented looked at that and said, this is so evil. It's grievous. It makes him sick. It's horrible. Some people have more satisfaction in life, but Solomon meditates on the fact that ultimately, when you're considering wealth and other things that we have, there's no way to achieve satisfaction. You keep going. It's an endless pit uh, looking for money. It's a dead end to solve your, your satisfaction woes. It's just one of many dead ends that we as creatures look to for our satisfaction. So central to who God is, though, is who he is. He is not a killjoy. He doesn't want to create us with all these wonderful things to experience and then forbid us harshly to experience them. He delights in giving us good things to enjoy. He's the Father who gives us all things. (coughs) So we are people who are made to receive gifts from God. As you think about the Westminster Shorter Catechism, I don't know if you know it, but number one is what is the chief end of man? And if you've ever read this, you might think it odd that it says in the answer, the chief end of man is to, and it gives you two verbs, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Now, that sounds like two things. So how can that be one end? It says what is the chief end, not ends, but one end of man, uh, and not two. Well, you know, I've heard it describes that this is like a coin with two sides. And what he is after here is that you have a calling in life, which is to glorify him, and you have a relationship, which is to enjoy him. And these things are so connected that they're hard to to weave apart and separate them, to glorify and to enjoy him. But this makes the point here that Christianity and Christians are not those who just obey a moral code in a different ethic than the world, we are those who do follow a biblical ethic. We do that only because we have graciously been brought into vital union with a God who is worth loving and enjoying. He's enjoyable. He enjoys giving to us. And we see that in his son. Don't ever let yourself believe that God doesn't enjoy giving to you because he's given you the greatest gift of all. He loves to give gifts to his people. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whether you eat or you drink, whatever you do, do all the glory of God. We're not sufficient to do that. God, as the second principle says here, must do that. I am not capable of creating joy and contentment and satisfaction in my own world. And if you look at what uh, this um, verse 3 says, 
you know, consider here, if you were in the ancient world to have almost infinite children, here it says 100, 200 children maybe, if you had 100 children and lived many years, even if you could live 2,000 years, or 1,000 years, it says in, 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 uh, twice over in verse 6, if you could even do that, what would that get you? All right? Well, he makes the case that the longings would never go away, even if you had what the two categories of, of, of blessing were in the ancient world, which is lots of children to carry on your name, and lots and lots of long life, which meant you were, you were blessed and righteous. Well, you would still be like, I need more. There's no contentment here. There's no satisfaction. The thing that a person you know, can't do for himself is to create a heart that is satisfied in Christ. God does that. Look at, ver- look at uh, Ecclesiastes 6 here. It says that the possessions are from the Lord. It says that in verse 2, he give- God gives wealth, he gives possessions, he gives honor, so he lacks nothing that he desires, yet God does not give them the power to enjoy those things. It's all about what God does. He's the sovereign one. Grace is sovereign. We get it. And all of our lives are meaningless unless God gives the meaning. Now, the wisdom of chapter 6 is going to help us to see what life really is, what's valuable in life. If you look at the example he uses here, look at verse 3. Yeah, that man who fathers hundreds of children, his life is long, but his soul's not satisfied with the good things. He has no burial. I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. Now, he says in his proverbial way of saying it that it would be better to never have been born alive than to be born and live 2,000 years experiencing the greatest of life and having all these children. That's what he says. We know that the miscarriage of a child is a tragedy. We know that abortion is a crime. We know that the death of a young child is terrible. It's wicked. We know that. We know the people of the 900s knew that. So the people in the 400s knew that, B.C. We, and they knew that in the first century when Jesus was walking the earth. May we never lose the horror of the death of a child. Because this is very, uh, for one thing, important to understanding the meaning of life. Solomon drives his point home here by comparing the vanity of life to the blessed man in the eyes of the world is nothing in comparison to a stillborn child who never sees this world. Why is that true? Well, Solomon knew of his older brother who died in infancy. And this is the first child, David and Bathsheba. And what did David view? What was his view on this child? Well, that he would see him again. This child never had to be uh, experiencing the, the pain of the world, the search and the quest for meaning, and the sin. But that child, because he's a, co- a child of the covenant, experienced rest. Rest. This is the great promise. Rest. In Genesis 5, the, the very end of the chapter, as we're listing off genealogies here, Noah is set up to do the next three chapters of Genesis. So the genealogy brings us from Cain and Abel down to Noah. And what is the, what does Lamech, the father of Noah, say that Noah is going to do? He's going to bring the people rest. This is the hope. Rest is the big, the big payoff of redemption. Rest, satisfaction, joy. Noah means rest. That's the word here. It says, this child, though he's never seen the sun in verse 5, he finds rest rather than the man who's lived 2,000 years. That is striking. That's not how we think. It's perpetual vanity, spinning of our wheels, if we are not resting in God, in Christ. There's no hope. Series, uh, there's a series of Proverbs in the following verses in 7 through 9 a series of Proverbs where Solomon gives us words before he concludes. And that second principle we saw is that not everyone has that gift, but the final principle is that life is short. There's these better than principles, and then he concludes with 
life is short. Yeah, life is vanity in verse 9, a striving after the wind. Well, here's what we conclude with. Whatever has come to be has already been named. And what is known, and, who, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute the one stronger than he. The, one, the more words, the more vanity. You can't, you can't argue with God. What is the advantage to man? Well, verse 12, it says, For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his life, his vain life, which he passes like a shadow, here one day, gone the next day. Who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? You know who can? God does. He tells us what is after, after the sun, after life under the sun. And that's the thing here, is that our life is few. It is short. It is brief. And in light of our short lives, in, in light of the, the, the things that we've already mentioned here, that God gives all gifts, and we may or may not have satisfaction, would you like satisfaction? Would you want satisfaction? Of course you would. The answer is not in money. It's not in power. It's not in your reputation. It's not in your community. It is not in anything you can acquire, but you can ask God to give it, and he gives it. How do you do that? You ask him for the Holy Spirit. You ask him to show you Christ, that you might believe in him, that you might obey him, follow him. Your days are short and your death will come unexpectedly. This is all true. And we all will sit and give account to God for what we have done with the gifts we have had. Have we glorified and enjoyed him or we haven't? And we are responsible for the grievous evil, for our sins. We will stand before a God who Solomon calls stronger than he in verse 10. Shortly, imminently, Christ is risen, he's reigning, and he's imminently returning again. Risen, reigning, and imminently returning. We will stand before this God and we will answer to one who is stronger than he. Also, look at what it says in verse 10. Whatever has come, he has already been, whatever has come has already been named. When you think about the, just, you might not think about this, but in naming in the Old Testament, it signifies three things. One, authority over the thing. You have the right to name this thing. Adam and Eve were given, Adam was given the, the authority to name the animals. When Adam is, receives his helper to complete him, what does he do in, in Genesis 2, 23, 24? He names her. The wife is under his authority. It says in the scriptures that a woman will leave her father and mother and be united to her husband, and the two will become one flesh. She shall leave and cleave to him. He is her her authority, and you see that in the taking on of a new name. You leave the old name behind, take on a new name. It's a change in authority. If you name a child, you're the authority over that child. You know? Number two, a naming is defining of a thing like that. Eve's name was Isha, Woman, right? She's woman because she came from man. Significant. It's defining the thing. Ish is man. Isha is woman. The completion of the man. A reflection of the man. And so he, he reaffirmed his authority in his defining Eve's identity. She's woman taken from man. Isha. Naming means you have authority and it means you declare and define the thing. And then thirdly, is you declare ownership and responsibility over the one named. Now consider this, the one who names us is stronger than we are. He will never be defeated. He's the sovereign God. He gives life and life of joy in him. He does that. And in Revelation, it speaks of us receiving a name that only he and I know. You know, this is like he names us. We, and we're baptized into the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He has authority on us. He has responsibility for us. We are his. <coughs> he has the naming of us. And he's stronger. Our lives are short, but the Lord is stronger than our death. We'll have eternal life. Death is not the end for us. We're going to live for him with ever, forever because he's strong. 
sinners are invited now to repent of sin and, and, and accept him, to believe in him, to live forever. And this is the final principle. What's the meaning of all this? Amy Carmichael, who we mentioned before, let's find a, uh, that last thing on the, on, the, on the slides of the sermon. What's the next thing? Go to the next one. Next one. Is that it? That's the, that's the picture? <coughs> that's where she lived till her last days, in India. She never came back to Ireland. She lived all of her days in India. She died in 1951. Her uh, grave is a bird bath outside of this, of this structure uh, where they fill it up every morning with water and it just has her name and, and death date on it. This is where she lived. There's a, there's, there's a mark on the floor there where her bed sat. What's interesting about this room is that she had a tragic fall in 1931 and spent the last 20 years of her life bedridden in this room. Now, at one point she thought she was in despair and she asked her doctor, Nancy Collins, a friend, you know, am I too much of a drain on this ministry because I can't do anything for myself? I'm totally dependent here. And what, Amy, uh, what Nancy told Amy, according to the journal, is that she read her Revelation 2 and said, the Lord says, I know and fear not. And these things really stood out to her that the Lord knows her and that she should not fear. And so she, if you'll know, if you, you maybe not, you maybe can't see the plastic she made, but that's what those say. I know and fear not. You see, we have in Christ not just an idea, but we have the person of Christ who dwells within us by the Spirit. He's, we're brought near to Him. He's with us, and we can know that. And fear not, because He will not leave us. He's promised to be with us. His Word is His promise. And we alone can know that. We've meditated upon His strength. There's a difference between one who's received those kind of things and someone who has never received the Holy Spirit. Now, what's this receiving the Holy Spirit? Is it one time or is it all the time? It's every time. We repent of our sins all the, all the time. We ask the Spirit to guide us, direct us, lead us into all truth. This is not a one-time deal. We live our whole lives pleading for the Lord to give us His Spirit, to bring us into communion with God and with Christ. Amy trusted in God's promises and served orphans her whole life. And that three-year-old was renamed by her. Beautiful flower. Once cast off, now beautiful flower. And that is a great picture of the Lord Jesus. Here's this once cast off little orphan who is a beautiful flower chiming out amazing grace to the, to the, to the ends, of, ends of India. Uh, the songs of grace ringing out in the hills. Her grave marked by a bird bath, her death date on it, and her legacy still remains. This woman, 72 years old, serving the Lord faithfully because she was picked up, embraced, and prayed for. And God worked in that. God answered those prayers. Amy was rescued, prayed for, and renamed as a beautiful flower. And I want to ask you, what is your name? Who is your daddy? Who is your daddy? Who is your, what is your name? What has he called you? What is your identity? Who are you? Do you know who you are? Are you a child of the Father? Are you this? If there is that, you have peace. You will have peace. You need to ask him. And, and, and uh, first, uh, in uh, Philippians 4, Paul closes with, May the God of peace be with you, the peace that surpasses all things. He says this, I rejoiced in the Lord. Now at length you have, you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me. And then it says, in closing letter, I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content, satisfied. I know how to be brought low and how to be abounding. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, this is the, this is the, this is the answer. Will you pray and ask God to strengthen you? It is available. You are His. He is yours. If He's named you, this is an ongoing process of resting in Him. That's it. Amy knew that. 
That doesn't mean she didn't struggle. She had to ask the Lord and ask help. And she received the promises from another, a friend, of what God is doing and who he is. We we're quick to forget. We've got to ask, what's our India? Who are we called to serve? What is our church doing? What are we elected for? What is our purpose? What are we going to do? You know, there's a, there's a great uh, division in our country. People hate each other. People are angry with each other because of politics. Uh, in 1858, and I'll close with this, 1858, there was a preacher in Charleston, South Carolina named John L. Girardo. He preached at, at Zion Church. This is a church mostly, mostly black people, 1,500 to, 12, to 2,000 people a week. And they would gather, and one time they decided to have a prayer meeting. They had a prayer meeting. And all these people had started growing, uh, and it, it got bigger, and, and then they, they prayed all night. And then eventually, after days and days of days, they're asking him, so when are you going to preach? This is a very powerful, amazing preacher. Everyone's there because they love this guy here, and he's preaching. They want to preach Christ to him. The leaders see the groups clamoring for this, and they say, do you think you should preach now? And he says, no, I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit. And so he, 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 this goes on and on and on, uh, day after day. And finally he says, hey, uh, the Holy Spirit's here. I will begin preaching tomorrow evening. And, and what do you think happens? They don't leave. They're not going to leave. They're not going to let him start tomorrow. It's now. The Holy Spirit had arrived. And what people who, who write about this event in 1858 say is they've never experienced anything as awesome as that. They're never experiencing anything as wonderful as what God was doing there extraordinarily in their presence. And, and later on they reflect in 1858, hey, there was a great problem in 1860 to 1865. There's a great war in our country. And God was drawing people in for that purpose. He was drawing people in to go through this. This is what they believe. They're, they're going to go through a great trial and they're going to manifest the glory of God to all those who they encounter. It's going to sustain them through this trial. It's the greatest challenge they've ever faced. And as you think about this, we have challenges ahead. We don't know what those are going to be, but God's building in us the faith. If the Spirit comes, if He gives the gift, we're absolutely powerless to bring it. He's not obligated to give us all these gifts. He gives it when we ask. And he does it. This is how he does. He gives the, the Father gives the gift to the Son, the Spirit. The Spirit dispenses it because he's the king and head of the church. He gives the gift. We ask. We're his children. We're named his name. We're adopted in his family. That is the end of this lesson. The meaning is, life is short. We don't have all the gifts. We don't have all the satisfaction. We ask for it, and God supplies. God prepares us for the struggle ahead, for the journey ahead. We don't know what that's going to be, but God will provide when we ask him. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we need satisfaction. We need to ask you for it so that you will give it. Draw us away from foolishness of, of independence and, and, and trying to solve it on our own and seek it through other things. Lord, where are we, Lord? Where are we serving you? Find, help us to find ways that you might be glorified and we might enjoy you, be satisfied in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we go to the Lord's uh, table this morning, we're going to do it you know, the same way we always do it. If you're here every week, if you're not here every week, I'll explain it real quick. This is only for believers if you're in Christ. If you're a believer in some other God, uh, we're glad you're here, but this is not for you. Uh, this is a, a, a setting apart of God's people who are in union with Christ through faith. And so if you're a believer in Christ, this is for you. You don't have to be a member of our church, but if you're a member of the body of Christ, repenting of your sin, trusting in Jesus for salvation, this is for you. That's, that said, we set these things apart with prayer. We ask for God to bless these elements because what they are is a sign of the, of the work of Christ for us and a seal of our faith, the strengthening of our faith. They strengthen us to trust in his promises. And he remembers us. And he will provide for us. We're going to drain on him. He's rejoicing in us. So we'll pray, and then I'll send you, as we begin to sing our, our song of communion, which is, It is well with, our, with my soul, you'll send, I'll send you to one of these stations. You'll get up and keep physical distance, wear a mask if you need to, and, and get to 
the point where you can get the elements, come back to your seat, sit down, and we'll take these elements together. All right, that said, when you rise up, what you're doing is you're, is you're, you're taking up the cross. You're saying, this is my identity. The body and blood of Christ are mine. I'll leave all, forsake all. I must eat of Christ. I must drink of him alone. Whether I'm naked, poor, despised, forsaken, in want, in plenty, he is my all. That's what we say when we take the Lord's Supper together. He is our all. This is our gospel. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you work in these uh, times, this opportunity this, to, to eat at your table uh, through the bread and the wine. We ask that you would take uh, these things and use them for our encouragement, for our nourishing. We ask that you would lift us up to commune with Christ, to, to, to be encouraged through his word made visible. We ask that you would do this for your glory, for your name's sake, that it might be well with our souls. In Christ's name, amen. So go and grab a piece of bread and either a, a cup of juice or wine and return to your seats. We'll partake together after we sing. Let's sing. Number 691, if you're looking for it.
praying, he took the right after uh, dinner, he took the bread, he broke it, and, and blessed it, and said, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat all of it. And then he took the cup. When he gave it thanks, he gave it to them and said, All of you take and drink. This is new covenant in my blood, poured out for the sins of many. Take and drink. Amen. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, bless these elements. Bless these uh, your children. Lord, bless us, we pray. For your sake, for our satisfaction, that we feast and rejoice in Christ all of our days. In his name we pray. Amen. This, uh, this morning, I want to direct you to a few announcements and have a special little announcement time today. Uh, a couple things. Uh, no Wycliffe Bible Translators Dinner due to COVID. Uh, they've canceled it. So, unfortunately, that's another casualty of COVID. Uh, unfortunately, that's going to be good, but maybe next time. Monday night after work. This is going to be not at Big Brew this week. <coughs> this is going to be at Cross Cannons. Cross Cannons? Canyons or canon? Canyons. Okay. Yeah. So I hear that? 5.30, Monday. It's, by camp, it's on Campus Corner at Blackbird. So on, off Boyd. Close to Blackbird. <coughs> yes. Uh, men's Bible study is still meeting Tuesday, 6.30. Rudy's. Uh, let's pray. We'll be in prayer for uh, King's Cross, ARP, our sister church over in Sepulpa. Great time to be with them last week. Uh, and to celebrate their becoming an Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church. Uh, if you would, uh, now let's, uh, let me direct your attention. Ian, come on up front. Ian, Ian Skinner. Ian uh, asked you, well, where's your India? Where are you called to be? Uh, Ian had no choice in this matter. But you've been, <laughs> you've been, you've been looking forward to it. You've been called. Uh, would you tell us, uh, I know you're going to Columbus, Georgia next, right? Yes. Okay. Tell us what you're doing there. Uh, I commissioned as an armor officer in May in the U.S. Army, and I'll be attending uh, armor school there at Fort Benning, Georgia. So I'll be a tank commander, I guess. <laughs> Commanding tanks. Very yeah. nice. Well, we've enjoyed having you in our fellowship the, during these months that you've been in school here at OU, and it is a, it's a reality of Mormon that we have to send some of our favorite people away all the time. So, and you've, you've seen it. It's yep. been a part of it. So, but we want to now uh, pray for you and your calling, and thank the Lord for your friendship and fellowship that we have, and send you off. Well, okay, let's pray. Oh, you're leaving uh, Friday. Friday, yeah. Yeah, Friday. so if you need help, let us know. Okay, cool, I will. Okay, thank let's, you. Let's pray, let's pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you for this brother. We thank you for the work of your grace in his life, from calling him uh, from a Christian home to love you, to serve you, to be a child of your church and covenant. And to see the fruit of your spirit in his life is a joy, uh, and we expect it to be a joy to many others as he uh, prepares for the next stage, as he goes to Columbus, Georgia. We ask that you go with him and bless him. Your spirit would, would dwell richly in him and produce uh, much fruit uh, as he has a, a wonderful calling uh, to walk alongside others uh, in his uh, in his group, and his battalion, all these uh, men. And we ask that you would, uh, in, in Ian, that many would find uh, a light uh, of your light and, and a messenger from you, an ambassador, uh, that you would draw them into just the right situation that they're prepared to hear the gospel and to see his life as he shares his very life with them and all these things uh, that he will be called to do. So we ask for his safety, his strength, his development, his, his, his courage to do the, the things that would glorify you and, and to bring honor to the name of Christ. And all these we, things we, we, we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. All right, brother. We love you. Thank, Thank you for you. Go sit down. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. All right. Well, let's uh, now stand. Uh, oh, wait. One more thing. Uh, the uh, children's boxes are in the... Uh, I guess we call that the atrium or the lobby, whatever you call it. Uh, they're out there. Grab one and fill one up. Those will be due on November 15th.
so November 15th. So fill out, or grab some of those, fill them up. Their website guidelines that should be uh, involved with those. It should be evident to where to go to find out what they need to fill up the boxes for Christmas Child. Okay, let's stand and sing our last hymn, which today will be not in our hymnal, but it'll be on the screen, which is Christ, Our Steady Anchor. by these pet names, beautiful flowers, but what is probably even more important is what we call Him. Uh, do we call Him faithful? Do we call Him Lord? So let's look up and, and ask for His blessing. Hear the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Go in peace.